Welcome to the summit, Questioning Life and Death. And I can now introduce you to Tim Freak. Welcome. Thank you. And thank you for being here. And you are an author, you are a philosopher, and you've written 35 books. And we are going to be talking about a few of them uh, in relation to life and death. And I've been reading this one, The Mystery Experience. And I've also been listening audiobooks to the ones you can show. Yeah, I've got uh, Lucid Living here and Deep Awake, which comes after that. And then my latest one, which is Soul Story. They, they make a nice little pattern there, don't they? Um, and those are the latest of the books. Um, so that, that's where I'm arriving at. And of course, new ideas have come on from there. Yeah, and I absolutely love the books. And it's, it's oh. about what, like, who am I? What is life? And what is death? And especially Soul Story goes into the death part as well. What happens as we are dying? And so my, my first question is, yeah, what, what is life and what is death? <laughs> That's, yes, let's just start with that. I love that question. I spend most of my time, Susan, um, just asking that question. I've spent all day today doing asking that question because it amazes me we can get through life without asking it because you know, every morning I wake up and there's this enormous mystery that I exist and I'm with my wife or I'm doing this, you know, whatever, I can think just that, what's that? And then we're heading to death, you know, what's that? So, you know, obviously it's a very, very big, big, big question. Um, but let me come at it this way, uh, based on soul story. I think what we can see is that whatever this is, it's been a, it's a process. It's not a thing, it's a process. And it's a constant flow of change, which we call time. And as far as we know right now, that process has been evolving for 14 billion years, roughly. And it's gone from the simplest uh, forms you can imagine, even before matter. I mean, if you go back to the, the, what fascinates me about quantum physics is that it's information. You, it's, you go right down and it's like, it's not even things. It's, it's probability patterns, whatever they are, which will become matter which will develop this incredible universe we're in. And then on our little planet, at least here, you get four billion years ago, life. And then from life, this other huge jump to the psyche. And the psyche is the Greek word, it means soul. It's the same word, one's in from a Germanic root, one's from a, a Greek root. Uh, and it's really referring to this other domain that we're experiencing all the time, which is non-material. So something, it starts non-material, informational, it becomes material, it becomes biological, and then it's ending up non-material again. And we have been through this, you know, the, we are part of this incredible 14 billion years of evolution. And that leads me to two things. I'm going to say this very quickly, um, but which is that I think what spirituality has been exploring is the last bit of that evolutionary process we're the spirituality is exploring the most emergent states the latest things to arrive and the one of the latest things to arrive is this profound sense of awakening to oneness with the universe so spirituality i think is actually the the leading edge of this 14 billion years of evolution and one of the things at the leading edge is where somebody who's an individual you developed as this individual you know the body is an individual the, the biology is individual the psyche becomes individual we becoming more and more individual and then through that there's the recognition oh hang on i'm the universe and 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 the way i feel now about that is it sounds if you're unfamiliar with it it sounds very grandiose but it's kind of obvious it's like well, what else could you be the, the universe has arisen as susan and now it's looking at itself and thinking about itself and going, what am I? And so on. So the first, just dealing with the first part of your question about life, 
it feels like that life is this process, this creative process of emergence, and it's happening in every moment. Like this one is more, this one is more, this one is more. And we are evolving as part of that. And one of the new things which is arising, which is as big a shift as the other big shifts, is the, this isn't in, in any of my books, it's, it's in what I'm working, at, working on right now, but it's the shift, the way I want to put it now is it's a shift from the individual to the univigil where the univigil is an individual conscious of unity with the universe. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. And wow, I say wow, because you actually, uh, you use that expression a lot, uh, the wonder. <gasps> <laughs> so, yeah, because in Soul Story, you, you talk about these life streams, soul streams, yeah. and it's, it's almost like, it can become like a, a god dream or, or, or because there, there are a lot of um, misunderstandings about afterlife and uh, there is you know, god what is god and uh, how can there be suffering throughout humanity if there is a god uh, then it, it how is that allowed for and so so it's interesting how you write about how god in a way is created uh, by this kind of soul so yeah yeah and, and these two are related maybe um i'm trying to work out whether we should talk about death or god they're both very big subjects first let's do both but um let's let's talk about god um the for most of history large sections whether they've used that word or not of humanity have at least had the sense there's something greater to, than them. Uh, the problem has always been that, that it's been seen as the source of the universe. And there's real problems with that. And which is why more and more people have become atheistic and go, no, that, that's nonsense. Because it's embedded in a very mythic understanding. Oh, there's a God and he creates the universe or it creates the universe. There's, there's lots of problems with that philosophically. One of them is you haven't explained anything. It's like you're trying to explain what the universe is and you've created an even bigger mystery, which is now God, that's created the universe. So you haven't, you haven't really understood anything, which is why a lot of people involved in science have rejected that as, as, a, as an idea. For me, as, someone, as a spiritual philosopher, the real problem is the one you mentioned, which is it doesn't really make any sense now, does it, to think to me that, that, that there's a God who creates the universe and and 14 billion years later, you know, we've got life and then 250 million years of dinosaurs lumbering around. And what's all that about? And why would you do all that if you were an all powerful deity? And then why would you create if you were an all powerful or loving deity? Why would you create a world full of such terrible suffering where you know, babies are being having horrible things done to them by 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 parasites and, you know, things which are just like it's hard to really see how that could be the product of um, this sort of benign wisdom. However, since I've been a kid and I had my first awakening, I've always had a very profound sense that there is something which is greater than us and that actually it is really loving. You know, it's, it, it is literally unconditional love as people say, it's this profound universal benevolence. So how can those two sit together? And, and the thing I'm suggesting in Soul Story, which is really works for me, is that God isn't at the beginning, God's at the end, as it were. That the universe isn't coming from that. It's flowering as that. And God might be the wrong word for it. It can be a confusing word. Maybe we should leave that, the word God on one side. Just call it the great mystery, because it's something greater than us. And it, by, that, by that token, it's a mystery, because... I, ca I can't know something greater than me. I can only know things which are less. <laughs> and it's even then it's hard. But, and so the idea which that I want to explore is what if that benevolent loving presence is the most emergent thing, not the beginning? So that it, the universe has developed from the simplest of things, literally like hydrogen and helium, into you and I having this conversation. And that is, we're having this conversation in the psyche or the soul, which is this non-material level of reality, which has emerged from the other levels. And the, as we come into that state of oneness, which is what spiritual awakening is, is about, we form a community of souls. And the image I have in mind here is a bit like, you know, here's my body. 
and it's a unity, but it's made up of all these different cells. It's a community of cells and each cell is independent and doing its own thing, but it all works together to create something more than each cell. And each cell, does, you know, this cell here has no idea what it's like to be Tim. And that it's a bit like that with the thing which is greater than us, that we come into this communion of souls and that God itself is evolving, emergent. It's arisen from this process. And we get to know, we, you know, I don't know what it's like to be God, obviously. But what I do know is what it's like to commune in God, because that's this immense love, this profound oneness, and this huge love and benevolence. So my suggestion to, for people to try out is don't put God at the beginning. Don't because their answer is nothing. You get a, a God who's a monster because he's created suffering or stupid because he's like, you know, what, the universe is so haphazard. But what if it's not that way around? What if it's the whole universe is flowering into the most emergent thing possible, which is the universe conscious of itself as one. And we get to play a part in that emergence. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it completely makes sense. And, and yet it, it could be a story, right? Like we, we can never know the whole truth. Like we can, we can try and, but it's, it's like, yeah. It's, it's the mystery, right? It's the mystery of what, what is life and death. It'll just always be a mystery. We have to keep that mystery. You're absolutely right. You know, it, it, all we can, what we can do is, is never forget how profoundly mysterious it is. That's my book, The Mystery Experience, is about, as you know. It's like, it's the mystery. Feel the mystery. Know the mystery. And then let's come up with the best story we can. So we can take all of the wisdom and knowledge that our ancestors have given us. and take it on why because everything's evolving so we now know far more than they did we have we can think in new terms because of them so let's work out the most plausible story we can and then pass that on to the next generation who will hopefully improve it and realize where we were wrong but we can do that and what's that's why i feel like spirituality has fallen behind because it gets stuck in the past it wants to keep the tradition why science has moved on so far is it's, it's, it's broken free of that and it's gone. No, let's think in new ways. Let's think in new ways. Ironically, now science needs to think in a new way as well because it's cut itself off from the most emergent levels of existence, the psyche, all the spiritual aspects, which for some people involved in science, not all, but some is a kind of a woo-woo. Whereas I want to go, no, this is actually very, very real. And if you, if you pay attention to it and you think clearly, you won't want to dismiss this. This is, and if you pay, if you, if we do, maybe there's one story which can unite all of our understanding, scientific, spiritual, all the rest of it. And that one story is, what is this? You started off with, what is this? This is the realization of potentiality on ever more emergent levels. That's what it is. It's this continual process where something new arises based on what's been before and something new and something new and because it's based on what's been before it's more emergent it's greater in some way and 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 all of that is the one in relationship with itself because what else could it be so here we are you and i we're the one i'm the one arising as tim in relationship to the whole you're the one as susan arising in relationship with the whole and then we meet and then it's like ah we're tim and susan for sure but also look a bit deeper and it's like the whole universe is there because that's what we've arisen from and that's what we're recognizing and that's what spirituality is the best of spirituality yeah yeah so we are the one that is called many things god spirit brahman what what um but we are we are that and we are also the individual person. So it's, yes. it's also this uh, paralogical thinking, you, you name it, right? Yes, yes. The difference in what I'm saying now from what I would have said 10 years ago is that I'm okay with people using the word like Brahman and people like that. But in, but in Hinduism, it's interesting. They, they divide, they have Brahman uh, Nirguna and Brahma Sanguna, which is the God without any qualities and then God with qualities. And for me where it comes from 
is not some great mind, is not a super intelligence, is nothing. That's why it's, it's like the whole process is arising from, from something so simple. Its only quality is it exists and it has the potential to become anything. And, and I think of that as like a field of being. There's a field of being in which all this information is arising because it can become anything. So what's, what's the ground? The ground is the, the possibility for anything. That's the ground, not a super intelligence. That, that's what it's gonna go into. A bit like, just like we did, you know, you and I started off as chemicals and uh, fertilized eggs, you know, nothing much. But then from that, next thing you know, we're having a conversation and that the universe is like that. It's kind of, whoa, and the next thing you know, it's looking at itself and tasting itself and thinking about itself and doing philosophy. And, and that's where this vision then, I think, you know, that's why it's so beautiful. But I, I, maybe we should dump for death because when I was talking about science earlier, I said, look, it needs to shake itself up. It's got stuck in the kind of a, a Victorian worldview in some ways, which sees everything is determined by the lowest levels. It's all physics, really. You know, your, your, you know, my love of my wife is just chemicals, really. These thoughts are just the brain doing things. You know, it's all programmed. I don't think any of that's true. I think we can have a completely different vision of how the universe works as physics which is perfectly compatible with all of the great findings of science, which I love. And then you don't have to stop. You don't have to go, well, there's physics and then there's biology. And then this is funny psyche thing, which is a kind of byproduct of biology. And you can go, no, no, no. This is another level of reality that has emerged. And just look, that's how you experience it. You experience it utterly differently. It's an imaginal realm. When you go off in imaginal worlds, if you dream or if you um, meditate or take ayahuasca or, or do any of these, just think, just be creative, uh, that there is another domain. Now, spirituality has always maintained that there is another domain, and it's the domain we exist in when we die. Lots of names for it. The bardos is my favorite, the ones from the Tibetan tradition. Um, and the issue there really, is, I think the, the, the issue around death, if you really want to get it clear, I think, is this. Look, you are already experiencing the sensory world of the body and you're experiencing the immaterial world of the soul or the psyche right now. You always are. There's never a time when, you you know, well, you're definitely always experiencing the soul. When you go to sleep, you don't experience the body. Not consciously. So you've got these two things are happening right now. The issue around death to me is when the body can't hold itself together anymore and it dies, do we continue to experience the imaginal realm, the realm of dreams, the realm of thoughts, the realm of images, this realm we're in right now? And of course, if, if the psyche actually is the, the, the body, is the brain, then no, you don't. But if it's actually, it's something which is more like the body's given birth to the soul and, the, and it itself has emerged and evolved into this domain in which it can sustain itself, which is what I think the evidence points to, um, then, yeah, it means that, yeah, when the body dies, this imaginal experience continues. And from what we can see from the huge number of people that have come back from, from a near-death experience and report things they it sounds like the most amazing vivid dream where they feel like they're experiencing something which is more real and more significant well more emergent states always feel more real which is why if you come into like you said i call the awakening state the wow why because it feels wow because it's more real it's more intense it's more beautiful it's more and that's what you get from people who who come back from uh, where their bodies have died, but they've gone off and then the bodies have been resurrected or, I mean, not resurrected, but resuscitated. And they tell us these amazing stories where they have continued to experience, but on a deeper level, this imaginal realm, the, the bardos, the heavenly realms, the spirit world, whatever, you, whatever all these traditional names for it. And what I'm wanting to do, Susan, and, and the work I'm doing now is even more so, but it's in soul story is to go look i we can there's a way of understanding this rationally which doesn't diminish the spiritual insight 
but links it to all of the insights from science of an evolving universe. So the difference for me is when I was young and uh, I would have said, oh, the soul exists and it's fallen into the body and it goes back home. And we, this is a kind of a mistake. We've fallen into this place. It's an illusion, and which is traditional spiritual thought. Now I would say, no, 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 no illusion, no mistake. It's evolved. And the immortal soul has evolved as well. It is a product of this 14 billion years of evolution. And when we come into one of the, the experiences often mentioned in the near-death experience is an encounter or an immersion in what's described as a, as a love light, or, or and as often interpreted as God. And I think when we do go into that light, it's where we commune in the communion of souls, which is giving so that the, so that we are coming into God and playing a part in creating God through this process of life and death, life and death, life and death. Yeah. And that light, you could say it's, is a consciousness of uh, being the source essence. And it, it's, it's uh, just that you could say, whereas, whereas now the human consciousness is the human world and whatever humans perceive as a reality. And when you die and there's this bado state, it's, it's the imaginal realm and it's all mental, you could say, a mental continuum. And then the light is, maybe there's none of those. Maybe the mental continuum is gone. You know, there's no form at all. I don't know, it's just light. And it's as, as pure or very subtle form of consciousness as the one. I had an experience on, um, well, it was Remembrance Day. We have a Remembrance Day every year in November in the UK. And it was, I, I remember it because it was on Remembrance Day um, in 2019, um, where I was catapulted, not, not through death, um, in a way that I've never remotely experienced before into that light. And there was only that light. And it was the most beautiful i can't even begin to tell you and had a huge effect on me afterwards uh, and was left with this sense of being held by something so benign but well, not but uh, but well, my interpretation of that though is very different again now than it would have been because i grew up with a lot of eastern not by the time i was in my teenage years i was taking on a lot of eastern ideas and a very common idea in the East is that you need to dissolve your individuality into the one, because that's how you find the one. And so there would have been a sense of, for me, I think that oh, I, I went into that one and there was no Tim. And then there was Tim again. And it's like, ah, OK, well, maybe when I die, there'll be no Tim and that'll be much better. I don't feel like that at all now. I think the individual is the foundation through which we experience oneness. So the evolutionary process, which has led to you and me as individuals, is not some sort of mistake or something to escape from. It's actually getting us closer and closer and closer as an individual to experience the oneness. But the nature of consciousness is focus. We're, you're, we're conscious of whatever we pay attention to. So I'm paying attention to you right now. I'm conscious of you. You know, I'm not thinking about my left foot, but now I am. Oh, now I'm conscious of my left foot. I wasn't before. And whatever you focus on comes into like you start processing that information in high definition and suddenly it's very, very real. That's why meditation works. So if you take your attention, which is moving quite rightly all around the place during the day, looking out for things and thinking about stuff and all this, and you go, oh, for half an hour, I'm going to just focus on my breath or focus on the oneness of being. And if you really do really focus on it, it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer until the world is full of the oneness of being. Occasionally, you can do that so deeply that there is nothing else. And you, you, you do not experience yourself as an individual. You do not experience any separateness. You don't experience thought. All of that just goes. But it doesn't mean it's not there. It's a bit like, you know, when you, when you have a dream at night, you can be completely immersed in a vivid dream. But it doesn't mean your body's not actually on the bed. It is. It's just you're not paying it any attention. 
And so when you're in a deep meditation or a spiritual experience where you've left behind, you don't feel there's any sense of time or it doesn't mean that it's not happening. It means your attention has gone somewhere else. And my sense then for death, uh, my intuition, if you like, that I'm exploring is not the idea which is common in the East, which is, oh, you're like, you, you dissolve back into the one like a drop into the ocean, which is a lovely metaphor. And when I was young, I liked it until I thought about it too much and just thought, actually, that's not such a great idea, really, is it? Because it means my whole life has been a waste of time. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, oh, I've just been through well, now 60 something years of struggle being a human being. And it's like, oh, to hell with that. Just dissolve back. <laughs> it's like, it's worth nothing. I don't think that's right. I think actually the struggle is to maintain your individuality enough that you can be so conscious that you can focus on the oneness. So the, the, as we go into the oneness of God, it's not about dissolving our individuality. That's the foundation. It's about learning to focus or allowing it to happen. Sometimes it just happens of itself. That we can immerse our attention in that oneness and we don't have to be conscious of all the other stuff, but it will be there and we can come back to it. And when I came back after that experience this time as an old man, unlike previously, there wasn't like, oh, Tim's back. It was like, oh yeah, here's Tim. And this cares about Tim, it really does. It cares about Tim, it cares about Susan, it cares, it really totally benign. It's not there going, dissolve, damn you. It's going, no, grow, become more, keep evolving. But now evolve with this experience of oneness as well. Yeah. And that's also in, in your book, Deep Awake, you're also going to, to that, uh, uh, kind of focusing on on the oneness we are and so that you can actually experience it for yourself in the human body it's not like we have to die uh, or, or go to the light to experience we are already it it's just a, maybe a matter of, of focusing or paying attention to it or um but but even if we don't do that we're still it we can't escape it right well the universe is is a one you know, it's a one thing. It's a universe. Everything is is just one. It, it is. But 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 actually, the most interesting thing is that it's also many, and it's all of these different perspectives on itself. So it feels to me like, look, we're here. We're alive. We're having this incredible experience. It's, it involves a lot of struggle and suffering, but it's also very very beautiful. And I've been lucky enough to know that you can that, that, that we can experience more emergent states things that gets called awakening like you said in deep awake i call it deep awake or the wow and i have had the pleasure of running events all around the world and online now where we get to explore this and i've seen so many people i mean i've lost count of the number of people who who have experienced it some many for the first time many who've experienced it before and want to get back to it. It's right there, but it's an emergent state. So anything which is emergent, it hasn't, it hasn't, it's harder to sustain. It's a bit like, you know, when you see a little kid learning to walk, the first few times you get up, fall down, get up, fall down. And then a day comes where you get up, don't fall down. Now they probably still will fall down, but it'll take longer. I still fall down and I've been walking for a long time, but, you get, and it's the same with this. It's like you build up enough, what I call passivity. You build up enough of the past. You've done it so much in the past that you can sustain it. So we can, we are, I think, evolving into these more emergent states. And I want to really give spirituality a makeover so that it's, it's ready to play the role it needs to play in taking us into this, is it is, is, is helping us support support us becoming not just individuals but individuals that's what i'd like to see yeah and also living lucid or lucid living <laughs> and the, so can you speak a little bit about that well lucid living is an interesting book because um I, it was my attempt it's a, quite an old book now it's come into three different editions and it was my my attempt i was really proud of it it's one, one of my favorite books really to capture the traditional view of awakening 
And as such, it's still, I think, a really powerful book. And, and, and I, I, I'm so touched that so many people love it. And the, the metaphor is simply the, the ancient one that's used all the time, which is that life is like a dream and you're both in it and it's in you, like you are in a dream. So in a dream, you're the dream character, but you're also the dreamer. And like right now, it's going, you're the same. It's like you're the dream, you're a character, but you're the whole thing. And that's a really powerful metaphor, which is why people have used it for hundreds of years. And I think I, I did a good job, if I say so myself, in capturing it. The only problem, Susan, is I now disagree with it. So um, one of the things about evolving is that you need to question all your own ideas all the time. So I spend a lot of time questioning my own ideas. So um, especially recently, I've had to come out numbers of times and go, do you know what? I, I was wrong about that. There's a better way of thinking about this. And it's hard because you've invested so much in the past that it feels like, oh, but, I'm, uh, but actually it's a really good thing to do. So there's elements of lucid living. I, 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 there's videos now I've made on the internet. People can check them out where I've gone. This is why I think there's something in it, but I was also wrong about stuff. And my later work, like uh, Deep Awake and, and, and especially into Soul Story and what I'm working on right now, can take it further. It's a new, that's, that was a statement, I think, of a 21st century version of the traditional spiritual awakening. And now I want to provide, I think, a radically new understanding, which incorporates the evolutionary picture we have from science. Yeah. Yeah, because sometimes in, in non-duality, for example, it's like, okay, there's no free will, there's no choice, there's just mm. what is, and it's whole and complete as it is, and it's beautiful, and, uh, but it does feel like ah, i do have a choice i i do have some free will and so it, it can be a little frustrating sometimes to wow it's just all happening and so so the whole in soul story when you also talk about the the potential and how how it's it's like the life streams and soul streams and how they actually can it is complementary to both again a paradox where well it all is as it is, as it is, and it's the one that's manifesting or appearing like this. Yet at the same time, it's also the many where there is some potential for this um, unconscious awareness, as you also call it, to to uh, yeah flower in in that individual and in the way the many appears. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, I did my, I, I was off one time I was seen as a non-dual teacher, I think by lots of people. And I was very influenced by non-dual in my own journey decades ago. I don't think much of it now, really. I, I kind of, I feel like it misses the point. It actually misses the point. And, and, and I think it can have a very negative effect on people's lives sometimes because of that. Um, and I say it's missing the point because I think the whole point is actually you as an individual. That's not the thing which is standing between you and the oneness. Why? Because this isn't all one only. It's just not. It is dual. It is the one in relationship with itself. That's what it is. And so everything is relationship. And we see this in relational physics, which says, look, everything seems to be a relationship. And you see all the way through. And then here, so what am I? Well, I am the relationship between this individual and the universe. I'm not this individual only. And I'm not the universe only. I'm the universe as this in relationship to itself. And that enables, you said earlier, you know, it's beautiful. And it's like, if you've really got non-duality, it's not beautiful. It's not anything. There's no qualities because every quality arises through relationship. Even consciousness itself, everything is relationship. So if you reduce it to the non-dual, non just being, you get nothing. Mm -hmm. So that nothing has become everything. And, the, and, it's, and it's not a, an illusion. I'm, I'm not of the, uh, not anymore anyway. I'm not of the, it's all gone terribly wrong school. I think it's all going pretty right. I think we're evolving incredibly. Um, and we need a spirituality which honors that and returns dignity uh, to human, the human adventure as a life. So the, and, and so this idea, look, you have no choice, nonsense. 
I, I really want to say it that strongly. That, that comes from this, in science, you see it with this reductionist idea, oh, you think you're making a choice, but really it's just physics. No. If you have this vision of the universe as a creative process, that creative process is arising on every level again and again and again as it evolves, which means the creativity which led to the first light, sorry, the first life, is now rising as what's this next thought going to be? And it's not pre-programmed. It's not fixed. It's actually creative. It must, it will involve the past. I can't think any thought. I can only think thoughts with the words I know, but that's a lot of them. And therefore we, 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 this experience of will is absolutely central. So again, it's not a mistake or just an illusion that human beings have arisen from the universe with this sense of how important our choices are. I think it's not, it, it, it's vital to who we are and we can choose where we place our attention which is why we can also choose to enter these more emergent states. Doesn't mean we could just do it like that always, although it can get, it gets easier, but we can choose. And, and anything which takes that away, I really want to return some dignity to our human existence because I, I think it's a, you know, it's mixed, you know, we're a mixed bag, aren't we? But it is a beautiful thing. It's a bittersweet experience we're in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it is confusing too, which, because it's everything and sometimes you can really feel like you're lost yeah but then you also talk about love that is like uh, love is is that you can never get lost in love yeah i think i think you know that i i had my first awakening when i was 12 and the biggest thing i got from it was oh my god the universe is pulsating with love i didn't know what the hell had happened it's like it was all one and or i was communing in that and there's enormous love, just like, wow. And, and because that's the language I had, I thought, oh, that's God then. Because I've been told God is love. And then there it was. It's like, oh, my God, that's for real. And here I am all these decades later. And that's still the most important thing. And, and the love is relational. Again, it's, the, it's where, we, where we meet um, with each other, with ourselves, with the universe. And that's why dismissing that which is often what this other sort of anti-life spirituality does, is just so sad. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. And what's your website so people can get in touch with you? You can find me on uh, timfreak.com, but that freak is spelled F-R-E-K-E. But it is, a, it is pronounced freak. It's kind of funny. Uh, it's an old English name. Timfreak.com. Thank you. Uh, it's been a real, real pleasure. I'm just thinking, it just feels like, because you were talking about Soul Story, I'd like to end with this little thought for you, which is, um, you'll remember this because you, you know the book, but about halfway through Soul Story, I kind of come up with this confession because the whole Soul Story is a book of philosophy. It's a book of how do we see this and science and all that. And yet really, all of that comes from this deep awake state and the experience of it. And when that arises, what, I, what arises in me, as I think it does for a lot of people, is so naive, it's almost childlike. And, and so really it's about trying to give some intellectual gravitas to something which is so childlike. And the line I think I put it in Soul Story, which felt like a nice way of rounding up the whole of our discussion, because it kind of captures all of it, was the day I thought, how, how, you know, this is feeling of knowing something, but what is it? How would I even begin to say it? And the words that formed in my mind at that time was, uh, life is good, you know, despite everything, <laughs> Which is, but despite life, everything, yeah, just life is good, death is safe, and what really matters is love. So that's, that's the, the essence of it, I think, for me. Life is good, death is safe. And what really matters is love. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah.